Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the second session of Faith in Public Square. We're going to start right now. So, um, Nanda, do you mind starting the opening prayer, please? Uh, yeah. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks as we gather here today. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit to fill our minds and our mouths with praise to you and love for one another. Guard our hearts and our thoughts that we may glorify you in every aspect of our lives. Above all, help us to love you more deeply and to serve you more faithfully through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank so, you. Before I hand um, back to our moderator, I'd just like to introduce her very quickly. Uh, so Blondie is a founding member of Young and Catholic Nigeria. She's also a tech professional and a beauty entrepreneur. She is the founder of Bath Candy, a beauty manufacturing company, and she currently lives in Canada. Blondie, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Nanda. Hi, everyone. So I'm going to introduce our priests again. I don't know if you if you were all with us last month, but I'm going to just do a brief introduction of our priests. Uh, we have Father Melchizedek Okwala, who's a priest of the Archdiocese of Lagos, and he just completed his license, licentiate in philosophy from the Pontifical University of Holy Cross in Rome. And he currently resides in Lagos. We also have Father Anthony Wosu, who's a priest of the Archdiocese of Lagos. But he's currently doing his PhD at King's College in London and is also the assistant priest at St. Boniface in Tooting, Broadway, London. And um, Father Emmanuel Ojefo, who's a priest of the Archdiocese of Abuja, and he's currently doing his doctoral program at the University of Notre Dame in Indiana. So welcome, fathers. And we also have a guest speaker, and I will introduce her when I bring her on. So over to you, Father Melky. You're on mute, we can't hear you. Thank you, Blondie. Can you hear me now? Yes. Good. Uh, so before us, we're discussing today how Christians can thrive in a woke, in a woke culture. Um, firstly, I mean, we don't know for sure if wokeism is already here with us in Africa, maybe Nigeria, but we're sure that because of where this whole culture has, you know, started or taken its roots from, which is the US, we know that it's just a matter of time. It's a global village today. So whatever affects one of the world powers has a way of diffusing itself and uh, eventually catching up with every other person. So it's, um, I think it's an important thing that we, we try to understand. I mean, it's, it, it's a broad and difficult um, terrain, but this is just me trying to, you know, put something out there and my understanding of what the woke culture is and what I think um, our Christian response should be to it. So just by way of um, introduction, I mean, the woke, understanding of woke, the word itself, I mean, is traced to um, a songwriter, an African-American songwriter by name Lee Belly. And he wrote a song called um, Scottoboro Boy. And he was talking about nine Afro-Americans, you know, who are accused of raping two white girls. And there he uses the term woke, exhorting the Afri African-American to be alert and attentive to the social injustices of white America. Basically, that's where uh, the origin of that term comes from. Of course, it has been used in different ways by some of the freedom fighters, such as um, Marcus Garvey and so on. But I think the term devolves more pertinently, more cogently in, in um, 2014 with the fatal shooting of um, the teenager Mike Brown in Fer Ferguson, Missouri. And um, the, we saw there with the formulation of Black Lives Matter movements, which actually used this woke um, word as a clarion call, you know, as, as a, to everyone to stand up against racial injustice, especially against the Black person. 
um, inst as institutionalized within the state, within the state institutions. And from here on, we've been hearing this world culture, it has nuanced into so many um, different forms. So today we, we hear of woke feminism, woke capitalism, woke students, woke children, even woke Christians. Um, at the heart of it is an ideology. So everybody, anybody who's agitating for something can pick it up, but the ideology being woke is actually um, an anti-establishment stance, you know, that encourages the critique of the status quo, a questioning of the status quo, a questioning of every traditional value that has come before. Um, and oftentimes a rejection of that which has come before. And I think that is the where wokeism has its own problem. Otherwise, there will be nothing wrong actually in standing up for social injustice or fighting for social justice. There'll be nothing wrong in that or being conscious or aware that some people are deprived and, and disenfranchised. There's nothing wrong about that. But I think where wokeism takes a wrong turn is making its posture, its constant habit to be a suspicious one of the status quo. You know, this constant corrosive search for things to hate, to rebel against, and 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 almost through mob action, give a positive incentive to, to take offense at every turn. Um, this is the hurt that I think wokeism brings to our world. Um, otherwise, I see it as a pale reflection of what it means to be conscious. Uh, consciousness is a very positive, it's a positive thing. It's a positive reality. It's to be aware of oneself and one's relationship with the other and the entire with the world at large. However, wokeism is a kind of consciousness too, but one that is rooted in selfishness. It is rooted in a certain over exaggerated, over bloated sense of autonomy that I rule myself. And so that makes me naturally suspect or suspicious of any other law outside of myself. And not just suspect, also it gives me almost the right to tear down that law because only I should rule myself. But at the end of the day, what we find is that the real understanding of what it means to be autonomous, in other words, to have self-rule, is actually inverted in that kind of posturing, in that kind of thinking. Because to have self-rule, to govern oneself, means to be able to control oneself, one's passions through reason. That's actually the true meaning of autonomy. But this inversion of autonomy is like, no, I do whatever I please. So it's not necessarily a self-rule, it turns out to be a self-enslavement. Rather than governing oneself, one becomes enslaved by the self, by one's passions. Whatever I want is what I do. However I feel is what I act upon. However, however I feel today is what I am. And this is the wrong turn I think we have with wokeism. Trying to locate it within scripture, I, I felt inclined to look at um, the fall of man, you know, the um, third chapter of Genesis. I was told that the snake was a very subtle creature, you know, and it spoke, it spoke to the woman and asked her, did God tell you not to eat of the fruit of the garden? You know, that subtle suggestion. Now in there, you can already see the challenge of the status quo, the, tr the challenge of, of what the tradition was, what the value was, what God's injunction was to Adam and Eve. Do not eat of this fruit. They were probably passing it. They weren't even looking at it. All. And then he comes, he starts, did you really? Did he really ask you, you know, so that challenge is already there. And then it says, um, yes, God said we could eat of every fruit in the garden except the one in the middle. He told us not to eat of the fruit or even touch it. If we do, we die. I said, no, you won't, replied the snake. God understands that in the day you eat that fruit, you will be like him. So already it creates this wedge between human beings and God, between the maker and his creature so that the creature begins to look at the maker as some kind of oppressor and themselves as some kind of victim needing some kind of liberation. So the moment they leave the law of God, she says she looks at the fruit. It looked good to eat. Now she's acting upon 
her own wish. I want to be like God, her own desire, her own autonomy. And the moment humanity did that, what happened? We fell. You know, uh, Hosea 4, 6 says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. And this knowledge Hosea was talking about was the knowledge of the law of God. Another translation for that perish says, my people are cut off. So when we zero down to that selfish autonomy, that selfish will, that passions, we do whatever we please, however we feel, we actually cut ourselves away from the will of the, of the, of the, um, of the creator. So in, in, in situating our position, you know, this whole understanding of wokeism in that, I think that was actually the first sense of wokeism. And we're told that when they ate the fruit, what happened? Their eyes were open. In other words, they were kind of, they were woke. Ah, they now knew what that God, what God did not want them to know. In a sense, they were woke, but at the same time, they were now ashamed. They were cut off from the glory of God. So it means wokeism in a sense is incomplete. And wokeism, people who mainly follow it are not really woke. Here's what I mean. They are just members of a subplot. There's always a larger plot that sometimes they fail to see. They say they're woke, but sometimes they're just recruits in a bigger picture. So the serpent had a bigger picture. He knew that if they took this, they would fall from grace. They had a bigger picture, but they didn't have that. They only saw the smaller picture. If we took it, it would be like God until it happened. And here we are today. You know, humanity is in this is in this corner state. So if we look at the larger culture, the way even the wokeism movement, the woke movement moves or operates, you see that it follows a similar a similar pattern. We always see this victimhood oppressor system. You know, they always try to set up, oh, we are the victims here and we are being oppressed by some group of persons or some other uh, section of society. The next thing that follows is the proliferation the pro proliferation or propagation of, 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 of whatever it is they're they are trying to advocate for. And then the next step is that they're fighting for legislation. So um, this is the tier, this is, this is the structure we've been, we've been seeing, I mean, in the world culture, in the world. And what, what is the Christian response? Or what should be the Christian response to it very quickly? I mean, um, Ranziger had told us that, that, you know, the future church is gonna be a church that will be persecuted, that will be smaller, but purer. That will be simpler, but more spiritual. So I think the first thing is to dispose our, predispose ourselves for that coming persecution, that it will come because it's after the church at the end of the day. And secondly, I think we also need to first listen carefully. I think in listening to the agitations of even uh, the people who are, you know, raising some issues in the woke agenda, if you listen to that, there's always some truth in what they're arguing about, but it's on this truth that a lot of falsehood is eventually woven around. So if we listen carefully, patiently, sincerely to them, we can actually address that truth and rob them of the unnecessary unconscious foot soldiers that eventually swell their ranks. Um, lastly, falsehood has to be overcome by truth. You cannot, you cannot overcome falsehood with falsehood. You must always come from the point of truth. And truth means understanding um, God's word. First Peter 3.15 encourages us that we must always be ready to have a response to those who ask us about the hope that we have in God. So it means we have to also be grounded and uh, on, understand God's word enough to be able to present a proper response. Lastly, I think Christian solidarity would help us. In other words, we have so many guilds, guilds of uh, Catholic doctors, Catholic lawyers, and so on. When, the, when you know something is afoot, I think information can help organization and cooperation and a proper response from um, church authorities to guide Christians on how to live. I mean, a clear example is what happened in Lagos State recently, the abortion law that was passed. I mean, the attention of the Archdiocese was called by the, 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 the Guild of um, Medical Practitioners. And of course, the church waited in and the state is putting all that on hold. So this is just um, a quick layout. I mean, I know I've already exceeded my time and this is meant to be more discussive. So I'll, I'll be quiet here and listen more to others and we'll, we'll expound as, as the discussion. Thank you, so, thank you very much, Father you. Melky. Okay. So we're gonna bring up uh, Father Anthony for your perspective. So you um, have the yeah. Um, Father Melky, thank you so much for this beautiful layout, very insightful and the perspective um, that you have given us. 
Um, this is an honest question. And it comes from, for me, from a place of genuine concern, worry, and fear. You know, Christians are worried about how they can live out their faith in this kind of counter-cultural, counter-Christian world. And for me, Christians who are asking, how can we strive in a work world? They sincerely wish to serve God, you know, as God deserves. But they are confronted left, right, and center, you know, by this contrary spirits, for want of a better word, this anti-Christian worldview that we find. In fact, the word woke is a mood, a feeling, is a mindset, is a, is a state of mind. Uh, and then it's also a posture, a posture that is anti-establishment, a posture that is like throw away everything, you know, my truth, a posture that is, that is trying to transvaluate every normative, every core value that we share. You know, these are people saying, you know, before now you have hooked with me with religion, my eyes are open and this is how I want to live my life. So Christians really, really feel threatened, think that world culture kind of portends a danger to the practice of the faith. In this dominant world, it kind of um, it poses a threat to authentic Christian witnessing. You know, so for me, I think that to thrive, to flourish, to prosper in this kind of world, we need the Holy Spirit because this is a very attractive, seductive, and fascinating alternative to the faith that they are presenting to young people, even to adults. It's a popular culture controlled by the social media. And this kind of culture, they try to set the narrative. They tell us what is right and what is wrong. And if you, if you resist, if you don't participate in this narrative, if you try to take a different route, you are canceled, you are attacked, you are, you are, you are, you are subjugated to you know, some kind of ill practice, you are segregated at the, at the place of work. And we look at you know, Jordan Peterson, look at J.K. Rollins, you know, if not that our own Chimamanda resisted that kind of culture by going out there to, 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 to say no, this is my perception of what a woman is. You know, they just try to do you complete harm. So it's a genuine concern for a Christian to say, you know, how can I practice my faith in this selfish, individualistic, you know, world of political correctness, alternative truth, false compassion that appear to promote and entrench, you know, uh, absolute freedom without responsibility, pleasure without conscience, feeling without reason, sex without commitment, money, you know, without some kind of hard work, politics without principle, using the words of Gandhi, and even love without sacrifice. So we're afraid, you know, even new converts are asking, you know, how can we, how can we continue to practice our faith in the university, at our places of work, in this dominant world? In Pope Benedict will say, aren't we afraid that if we let Christ in, if we let him take residence in the castle of our hearts, you know, something will be taken away from us because this is what the world is saying, that Christianity does not give us joy. Christianity makes us suffer. Aren't we afraid that if we let him in, he will take something away from us, something that makes life beautiful, something that makes life attractive and happy. Benedict says, Christ takes nothing away from us, but he gives us everything. So I think it's a genuine concern. And that's the first thing I want to note. How can we you know, thrive? How can we flourish in this kind of world? The first thing that came to my mind is to say, we need to wake up our faith. Psalm 57 verse 8 says, awake my spirit and I will awake the dawn. To understand this psalm for me, the background is a bit important. In, in the ancient world, the dawn is like a winged goddess that has a fruitful womb and a clear vision, but unable to see because she sleeps all the time in the water bird. So when the psalmist wrote this, there is something going on there. In fact, the dawn is also the mother of this star, like the flourishing star. So it's like, for me, I feel like we need to wake up our faith. It's like a sleeping faith needs to wake up because the kind of Christianity that is at war with the, with, with the world culture today is a Christianity that is lukewarm. Um, it's a Christianity that is, for want of a better word, that is skin deep. You know, someone said, if you scratch a Christian, you find a pagan. 
You know, it's a Christianity that is, is, that is half-baked sometimes. So we need that, that to wake up that interior radical faith to be able to confront this world looking at us. In 2009, an, an American congressman, Kennedy, had a conversation with his bishop. Here he insisted that he's a Christian, but he supports all the secular liberal values. And the bishop said, you can't support all these values and say you're a Christian. And then the bishop wrote him a letter that it, these values that you support, they don't only make you less a Catholic, they make you less a Christian. So the point is that what does it really mean to be a Christian? I think that's the thing. If we say we are Christians, I think we first of all need to ask, what is the quality of that faith? And if that faith is dead, we need to wake up that faith because we are up against a very dominant culture that is ready to completely you know, put that faith out. So we need to wake up our faith. That's the first way I think we can thrive. Get, get our faith to wake up. The problem is not with Christianity. It's about it's how we practice that Christianity. So if we wake up our faith, then we can be able to thrive. The second thing is that I see this woke culture as Father Merkel laid out as an opportunity. It's a mission territory. I don't see it as too negative. It's, it's a culture teeming with people who are hungry for meaning, purpose, and direction. And then we can provide a counter narrative, a narrative that is the Christian gospel. I think that we need to stand for the truth. We need to stand for the faith. We need to evangelize and re-evangelize this world culture. This is how I think we can thrive, by authentic witnessing. And let us not be afraid. The church you know, has always survived through persecution. I mean, the kingdom of God was established against the kingdom of Rome. You know, it took root and spread through the land, spread through the, the nations. Let us not be afraid. In fact, in Matthew chapter 16, if you read from, you know, 13 to 20, and Mark chapter 8, 27 to 20, Jesus was asking Peter, who do people say I am? What is interesting is that the location of this question is a place called Caesarea Philippi, in the far north of Israel. There is a cave there called the Cave of Pan. The Canaanites worship Baal there. The Greeks themselves worship Pan there, Zeus and other gods. And under this particular cave is a place called the gate of the underworld, like an abyss. Why did Christ choose to establish his church on that rock? Yes, he told Peter, you are the rock and you are shall build my church. This is the, this is the greatest opposition to, to, his, to, the, to the Christian faith. So Christ established his church in pagan territory to make it clear if my church can stand on this rock, even these gates of the underworld below Caesarea Philippi cannot prevail against it. So that if every religion resembles its founder and our faith is founded on Christ and Christ founded it on this particular site of opposition, persecution and counter-Christian values and it's to the test of time. If we take this world culture as a mission territory and continue to hold on to the core values of our faith, we can re-evangelize the world. I mean, the gates of the underworld cannot prevail against Christ's church. But what are the strategies to re-evangelize this world? What are the strategies to, to reach out to these people who are hungry and perhaps angry? And that's why they are like iconoclasts. Iconoclasts means someone who breaks every image. They want to break every traditional image, the image of the church, the image of core values, the image of the family. They just want, just take everything out. It's a world that has lost the sense of sin, the sense of the sacred, the sense of shame, the sense of God. So it's complete you know, anarchy because if you take God out of everything, it's chaos. And this is a world that we have to evangelize. By, by evangelizing them, by going to reach out to them, devising creative means of evangelizing them, we become indeed flour a flourishing prophetic church. So two strategies are proposed before I conclude. The first is the principle of truth and charity. Without truth, without truth, charity is false love. So we need to speak our truth, the truth of Christ. And it's not relative. It's the ideal truth of our faith, our core values, the gospel teaching. When St. Peter said, for the he quoted it, 1 Peter 3, 15, be ready at all times to give account of the hope you have in you. But do it with, with meekness, with humility. So we need to hold on to our core truth. Without that truth, we can love people who live in the world culture. We need to stand for our truth. But we can't do that without love. Because truth without love is arrogance. 
is self-righteousness. It's, it's political correct, it's, it's, it's self-righteousness. We are telling these people that you are wrong and we're not helping them to come out of where they are. So I think that we need to tell them the truth, but we must do it with love. And this for me is very, very essential, truth and charity. I mean, if we don't have truth, I mean, look at Ketanji, they asked her in the Supreme Court, she's a woman, who is a woman? Who is a woman? She said, I don't know. I recently in the Anglican Church in the UK said there, 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 there is no definition for a woman. Well, we have to say the truth. Why is she afraid of sin? She knows the truth. She's a woman. She's a practicing. She's a Christian. Why? Because the culture is a very aggressive culture. They cancel you. So I think that we must not shy away from the truth. We need to stand for the truth. Secondly, we need also the principle of wisdom and gentleness. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 19, Jesus says to them, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. So be gentle as a dove, but be wise as a serpent. They need to be wise as a serpent. That means they need to be shrewd. They need to be, we need to be shrewd. We need to be cunning. It's not necessarily negative in that context, in the way it's used in Genesis. It, it, it has a sense of being prudent. You know, it has a sense of being um, aware, being socially and emotionally intelligent. So at a place of work, even when you're standing for the truth, you need social and emotional intelligence. If you want to reach out to people, we need the wisdom, that wisdom of, of the serpent, but we also need to maintain our moral values. We cannot relinquish our innocence because we are trying to be tolerant. We are trying to be charitable. We are trying to be compassionate. If we do that, then that's false mercy. So we need the two principles. First, truth and charity. Secondly, the principle of wisdom and, and, and the, um, and innocence. When we combine these two attributes, then we can reach out to, to this world. But lastly, dear friends, I think we need personal encounter. This, this means a lot to me as a priest. I think that, you know, when I say scratch a Christian and you find a pagan, you begin to think sometimes that the kind of Catholicism we have, let's begin with our own church, it's, it's, it's a kind of Catholicism where you have sacramentalized Catholics who are not evangelized. And so when you scratch a Christian, you find a pagan. Yes, we believe. Yes, we profess the faith. Yes, we come to church. Yes, we know our creed. But have we had that intimate personal encounter? Do we have that relationship with the Holy Spirit that guides us through this kind of choppy water? I think that we need to encounter every Catholic need to have a personal deep, intimate encounter, that intentional followership of Jesus, that relationship that gives meaning, direction, and purpose to life. Maybe this is what Pope Benedict means when he says that to be a Christian is not just a, a, a lofty idea that we embrace, like ski, skydiving or ethical choice, like just knowing what is right or what is wrong. To be a Christian is to encounter a person, is to have a relationship with an event this event that changes how we think, how we act, how we choose, how we relate, and how we, how we interact, interact with people. So I think that we can thrive, but in thriving, we need more importantly the, the, to have that intimate encounter with Christ. I will stop uh, to, to allow Father Emmanuel um, to continue the discussion, but let us please take note of the fact that when this encounter occurs, Things change, perspectives change, relationships change, interaction with people change, prayer life change. And only in that way, only in this, with this kind of encounter can we have what for me, I believe we need more importantly, that, that strong faith to be able to, to withstand this um, storm, uh, choppy water or to withstand this, this storm, the storm of war culture. Thank you very much, Father Anthony. Uh, Father Emmanuel, you have the floor. So much, Blondie. Thank you, Father Melchizedek and Tony, for the incisive contributions you have made to this discussion. Um, I think it does make sense to um, believe that being woke means different things to different people. Um, from the contributions of Father Melchizedek and Tony, we can 
decipher two, two, two important lines of thought. So there's this awareness or alertness to situations of um, social injustice in our world today. And that is something that is very important for us to take note of when we speak about being woke. So um, there's this sense of awareness, whether it's, whether it's racial injustice, whether it's um, um, the, the death of migrants who are trying to cross over from Africa to Europe, whatever situations of social injustice that exist in our world, being alert to them is something that um, is um, meant by being woke. But there's also a second line of thought, which is this deconstructive outlook that adopts a radically leftist um, kind of political position that cancels out alternative um, voices and believes that only its position is worth a breathing space in public life. So we talk about the cancel culture. If people do not accept your opinion, you cancel them out. Even, I mean, it goes as far as canceling out church teachings, official church teachings, official church positions, because they do not conform to a certain mentality. Father Tony has spoken about being woke as a feeling, as a posture, as a kind of a, a mood. So we must be aware of these two sides and be sure of what we really are talking about when we use the concept woke. But having said that, I should also um, note that being woke is not anti-Christian and it is not anti-Catholic. In the Gospels, Jesus invites us to not be indifferent to situations of injustice, to be alert, to be awake, to be vigilant, to be aware of what is really happening around us. So indifference is not a Christian virtue. Apathy, just sitting down there and not being concerned about what is happening in our world today is not a Christian virtue. In 2016, Pope Francis um, published a message for his World Day of Peace where he was talking about the globalization of injustice globalization of indifference in our world today. And he says that there are many Christians who are just totally blind to what is happening around them. They watch the television, they listen to the radio, they read the newspapers, but they are just not moved by situations of suffering and injustice that they see around them, almost as if the troubles of those who are suffering are their own business and none of their own con none of their concern as, as Christians. And he says that we need to change that attitude. The opposite of love is not hate, it is indifference. The opposite of good is not bad, it is indifference. And that's something that looking back at the history of humanity, at least even in the last hundred years, we can see, I mean, we ask ourselves, how did such tragedies like the two world wars, like the Jewish Holocaust happened, that six million people could be killed and the world just moved on as if nothing did happen. So as Christians, we need to be alert, to be aware, because this is what Jesus invites us to do. I mean, a very um, 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 impressive gospel story that comes to mind here will be the story about the rich man and Lazarus. We can see what indifference does, that this man is here, he feasts sumptuously every day, but he's not alert to this poor hungry fellow clothed with sores all over his body. The dogs of this rich man are even able to recognize that there's something wrong with this poor man Lazarus, but the rich man is not aware of that. So um, we need to hold on to that tradition of being woke that is not anti-Christian and anti-Catholic, which is a tradition of being aware that many things are going on wrong, going wrong in our world today. And as Christians, we need to open our eyes to the situations of injustice. There's a long tradition, an ancient tradition in monasticism in Syria that describes a monk as a person who remains standing. The, mo the monk as a person who remains alert, the monk as a person who is awake, who is aware, and we can as well say the monk as a person who is woke, as someone who is conscious. Because Jesus says, um, you do not know the day or the hour when your Lord will come. So always stand ready, be awake. So that sense of being woke, being alert, so that we are not taken by surprise by our master's arrival is something that is it's a tradition of wokeism that I think that as Christians we can hold on to, which is very important. So I am saying that being woke is not opposed to Christianity, but again, we must be aware of what line of wokeism we are referring to, not the deconstructionist political position that cancels out every alternative position, but this awareness to situations of injustice. In September 1965, when Pope Paul VI um, visited the United Nations for the first time, and this was the first time in history that the Pope was speaking to the United Nations, he gave an address in New York that where he said that the church is an expert in humanity. That's a very impressive statement to make, that the church is an expert in humanity, meaning we've been here for 2000 years and we have acquired a deep wisdom that is born out of experience of having journeyed with humanity for 2000 years. 
And that there's no empire, no kingdom, no institution that has outlived the Catholic Church in terms of stability over a long period of time. So the point is that there's really nothing new, no new philosophy, no new ideology. Nothing is coming up or emerging in our world today that takes the Catholic Church by surprise. I mean, if it is in terms of basic principles that we need to handle every ideology or philosophical position or public issue, whatever it is, or social justice issue, the church already has a long tradition of, um, of discerning these issues and making her own contributions in the light of her ability to read the signs of the time. So I think that this is not something to be really afraid of. We must be conscious of the sort of world that we are living in and then, so Francis said in um, his um, um, in his encyclical Morris Laetitia, Apostolic Exhortation, and Morris Laetitia, that as Christians we sometimes dissipate so much energy condemning a decadent world. Oh, this is bad. This is bad in this world. This is bad. This is bad. And he says we do less of um, providing remedies for redemption. And I think that we need to take that seriously. So that our own attitude is not just one of condemnation and condemnation, but let's see, let's see, let's see the plate and see what good elements of what is happening around us we can um, integrate into our own Christian framework. And what are those things that we need to at least say? Well, I think we need to have a debate. We need to have a public discussion about these sorts of issues, because I believe that. Um, we have to rediscover what it means as Christians to love the world. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. That's perhaps the most revolutionary statement to make in the Bible. God so loved the world. And we cannot redeem a world that we hate. We can only redeem a world that we are in love with. So as Christians, we need um, to stand at a position of critical distance from the world. So we are in the world, but we are not of the world. We need to stand at a position of critical distance from the world. But we also need to stand at a position of critical closeness to the world, because we do not need to adopt this position of just standing outside, being like um, disinterested observers, bystanders to what is happening. We need to we need to take off our garment. I mean, like um, T. S. Eliot says, we need to roll up our sleeves, take the church on our back, and enter into this dirty, messy world. Pope Francis uses the image of the church as a field hospital out there in the battlefield. He says the church, he prefers a church that is bruised, dirty and smelling because the church is out there trying to help people, trying to redeem people rather than a church that is simply confined to its own position of institutional security, just being closed in on itself. Having said that, let me just, um, um, just um, mentioned that for me, the, there's something about being woke that I think that we need to look at critically. Father Tony mentioned it, it's, and it's a question of truth, which is that for wokeism has this attitude, a certain um, brand of wokeism has this attitude that truth is a reality that can be made or created, not something to be discovered. And that's something that needs to be confronted. And that's where we hear things like my truth, your truth, and in between my truth and your truth, there must be the truth. And so it's, it's, it's really a question of truth. This idea that truth is what you make it to be, that man is the measure of what he says is right and what is wrong. In 2005, the last mass that Pope, um, Joseph Ratzinger officiated before they went into the conclave that elected him the following day as Pope, he spoke about what he called the dictatorship of relativism, this idea that there is no objective truth, there are no objective truths out there, that truth is what everybody makes it out to be. And he says, how many, how many winds of doctrine have we been used to so far as Christians? He says, we have jumped from Marxism to libertinism to liberalism to all kinds of ideologies. And it is this question that there is no stable center. It's a narcissistic world where people are looking in on themselves. So Narcissus, Narcissus is this figure in Greek um, um, mythology who was impossibly handsome, fell in love with an image of himself reflected in a pool of water. And that's really what the world is becoming, that we are just looking inward. There are no stable... There are no stable, um, no stable anchors, moral anchors upon which people can build their lives. So somebody is a Marxist today, the following day he has jumped on another bandwagon of libertinism, the following day he has jumped on another bandwagon. And the question is, how do you live your life just, just jumping from one sort of philosophy to another? And he says, today, even being a Christian, 
living according to the creed of the church is labeled as fundamentalism. So if I say I'm a Catholic, I believe all that the church teaches and holds to be true. People say, oh no, this guy is a fundamentalist. And he says, how have we arrived at this position where standing by the faith of the church, believing what the church believes and teaching what the church teaches is labeled as fundamentalism. But everybody out there who holds a contrary opinion is not said to be fundamentalist. And, but he makes a conclusion that, which is where I want to stop for the moment, where he says that um, we who are Christians, however, have a different goal. The son of God, the true man, he is the measure of true humanism. And I think that that is very important, that we have to go back to rediscovering who Christ is. Father Tony has made a, a very important point about this question. Who do you say, who do the people say that I am? Jesus is the measure of true humanism. So it's not me. It's not truth. It's not what I make it out to be. What is truth? That's the question that Pilate asked Jesus at the moment of his trial. But that was a very superfluous question because if he was perceptive, he would knew that he was standing. He would know that he was standing in the presence of the one who says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. If you're a Christian, you must take that position very seriously that Jesus himself is the measure of true humanism. And that it is from this position of having this deep personal relationship with Jesus that you can begin to address some of these issues that wokeism throws up in our society today. Thank you very much, Father Emmanuel. Thank you to all our three priests. I think this has been very enlightening. And I want to introduce our guest speaker, Catherine Bennett, who is a Catholic school teacher from the UK who runs a podcast called Choose Agape where she discusses matters on faith and truth from a Catholic perspective, and you can catch her on YouTube as well. Uh, Catherine is a revert as she was raised in the Catholic church, but she later rejected its teachings because they just didn't make sense to her. Uh, now she's back and she wants to help others discover the truth, beauty and goodness of the Catholic faith by tirelessly working to change the educational system. So Catherine, welcome and you're on mute by the way. How's that? Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Okay, great. Hi, everybody. Um, yes, I'm a revert to the faith and what brought me back were not soft, tread, treading softly and uh, telling me what I wanted to hear. What brought me back was a slap in the face of truth, uh, which is what we need to do, I think, is we can't always um, be so gentle that we mask what is true and what people need to hear. Um, I think it's always important, of course, to define your terms and I don't know if there is an agreed understanding of what we mean by woke. Um, so in that case, all I can do is say how it seems to me as a Catholic teacher in a Catholic school and knowing about lots of Catholic schools here in the UK. I don't know how it is there, but um, woke as I see it um, is antithetical to the faith. Uh, I agree with Father and thank you, Fathers. I agree with Father Emmanuel that um, there is good in, in it, this search for, for justice, um, but how it's actually lived and how it's actually, how it manifests is um, divisive. And we know wherever we see division is the enemy at work. As I see it, um, creeping into our Catholic schools here uh, is the narrative of BLM, uh, this perfectly reasonable sentiment that Black Lives Matter, of course, because like any other life, these are human beings made in the image and likeness of God. But if that, if that then um, means that we pit one group against the other and we shake our fists in the air and say, no justice, no peace, uh, this is not Christian. And we have, everything we, ha we, we have everything we need in our faith. We don't need to turn to these secular ideologies. The same with feminism. What we see in schools is, um, we have an injustice on one side, which is the patriarchy and men and let's blame men and call men toxic. And so in order to right that wrong, we imbalance on the other side. So we say we've got one injustice. And so what we'll do is we'll have an equal but opposite injustice, but it's still injustice. And so these ideologies, as I see them, uh, coming into education, coming into Catholic schools are divisive and they're pitting people against each other. And so we do need to wake up but we need to wake up to the fact that we're in spiritual warfare, that we're in a spiritual battle, that our enemy is not our neighbor. It's not uh, one group against the other. It's always uh, Satan. It's always dark forces at work. 
And that's what we need to wake up to, that we are in spiritual warfare. Um, what I think is happening is uh, a fear. As I see it, it's fear. It's like Abraham, uh, who God promised a son. And Abraham tried to trust in God and went about his business and then finally thought, no, I'm too old. I reckon I need to um, have, a, have a son, have a child with Hagar, my, uh, my wife's uh, hand, handmaid. But, um, but he was wrong. He took matters into his own hand and he was wrong. And that's not what God meant. Uh, when the Israelites were going to war with the Philistines, uh, they were waiting for Samuel to offer sacrifice and King Saul takes matters into his own hands and says, oh, I can do this sacrifice. And there are consequences to that. And so we see this throughout scripture, this, this turning to away from what God wants, turning away from God's commands and taking matters into our own hands. And when we do, um, there are consequences for that. We must suffer the consequences. And I think with these woke ideologies, we're turning to ideologies outside of our faith and they are causing problem, problems. And one of the problems they're causing is they're saying you, it's not respecting and recognizing people's dignity as a child of God made in the image and likeness of God. So it's saying because of how you are, because of how you look, because of what you uh, claim, who you claim to be attracted to, oh, it's okay, just, just stay where you are or how you are. And we don't expect, uh, we don't expect anything of you. Um, <clears> or <throat> well, we don't expect you to be able to attain the truth. In fact, even talking about objective truth is, as I understand it, uh, white privilege. Um, so I go to the words of Peter Kraft when he talks about love, and I think this is brilliant. He says, God is a lover, not a warrior, right? No, God is a lover who is a warrior. The question fails to understand what love is. Love is at war with all love's enemies love fights and I think we talked about opportunity I think you're quite right fathers uh when you speak about opportunity in the 1990s or early 2000s there were some wonderful um atheists the new atheists Christopher Hitchens uh Daniel Dennett and they were absolutely wiping the floor with Christians and the Christians who spoke in the public square were embarrassing and they were destroying us and in response to that has come about um, an opportunity to say, no, your perception of Christianity is wrong. It's, this is not, this is not what, this is not what we're about. And so now we have a chance to show you what we're about because they opened up that space. And I think this woke culture and these ideologies are a chance to open up this space for us to speak truth, which young people, and I'm speaking particularly about young people as a teacher, are absolutely thirsty for. They're thirsty for it. And when you speak to them about, about the teachings of the church when you say to them these are tough it's tough to be a christian but you're called to something tough you know um what is it what is it pope benedict says um the world offers you comfort but you're not made for comfort you were made for greatness and if you say to young people this is what you are made for and you're called to something higher they that you can hear a pin drop they're desperate to hear that but too often they hear words of appeasement words of um you know, equality means let's level everyone the same. Equality, as our catechism says, does not mean uniformity. Um, we don't respect people's differences. We don't respect women. We don't respect um, people who, are, who say they're gay by eradicating those differences and leveling everything off. So it's not about saying everyone's the same. So I think it offers an opportunity. I think it's fear ultimately that stops us from again going back to schools that stop schools from turning to our faith it's like a loss of trust in the teachings of our faith we're so frightened we're so frightened to to be called names to be called bigots uh, and it's that fear that stops us from going to the gospel from going to the teachings of our faith and saying actually everything we need is in here and it's not to say there aren't injustices of course it's not to say that there isn't terrible injustice but what it also does when we do that is it, ta it takes away the human person standing in front of us because what this woke ideology does is it pits group against group. It looks at big causes. It looks at global issues and it excuse. And when we say, look, I'm, I'm supporting this cause with a banner and then, and then knocking the person next to us in the face with our elbow, it's like, what, 
why are we distracting people from the person right in front of us, this commutative justice? Yeah. Um, so I think it can make us blind to the very human person standing next to us. And we get people all het up and riled up about a, about a cause. And we tell people they're victims. We're all victims. We're all victims of a fallen nature. We're all victims of a sinful world. We're all prey to death. We can't eradicate that completely. The poor will always be with you. Yes, we can do what we must do and we should try and right wrongs and, 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 and bring about justice for the kingdom. But we must, we must re be real about, about who, who the enemy is and be real about the fact that we are not just victims, but perpetrators, each one of us. That line of good and evil that runs down each, each and every human heart. It's not all that colour people are enemies and all that colour people are victims, or all this group of heterosexual, patriarchal white men are perpetrators and all these who aren't, these women are victims. Because all that does is take away responsibility and, and remove human dignity. Um, so I think what we're called to do is to speak truth and not be quiet and not be afraid um, and trust that God will strengthen us and maybe we'll get cancelled, but well, God will, God will be there. God will make it right. I think we just have to keep speaking truth into the culture and, and not let fear stop us. And we've seen in scripture what, what, it, what can happen when we let fear uh, make us take matters into our own hands. Thank you very much, Catherine. Thank you. I think it was really great hearing from all the panelists and hearing from everyone. And I'm going to jump right into the questions. We have a couple of questions from the Q&A <laughs> box. So the first question I'm going to address to um, actually any of the fathers can decide to answer this question. Um, so the first question is, I don't agree with some of the teachings of the Christian faith, as I believe that some of them are harmful, but I still identify as a Christian. Um, and for context, um, I know abortion is a sin, but I do not agree with the state taking away um, a woman's right to decide what happens to her body. How do I reconcile uh, my faith with the overturn of Roe v. Wade? So that's the first one. And the second part to that is, how does a Christian marry their ideas of what is socially equitable with Christian ideals when they don't tally? So I'm gonna stop there and then I'll add on after we've had a response. So who wants to take that? Okay, let me just go quickly. And um, yeah. the, the context she gave, I mean, first and foremost, if you have a problem with um, Christian doctrine, ask. Okay, I think that's why the priests are there. That's why catechists are there. Ask <clears throat> so that you can be better instructed. I think this is the positive side of um, being woke, being awake that Father Jafer was talking about. I prefer to make the distinction about being conscious as being the positive kind of wokeness as different from wokeism as the culture that we are seeing, the trend that is building from the West you know, mainly from the West. That's, that's, I wanted to make that distinction so we don't conflict issues. And that's why I said the proper thing, it should be consciousness to know that you're aware. Um, but this wokeness has, yeah, there's a good side, but it's mainly pejorative, the way they are pushing it. Uh, so yes, and I said one of the solutions, I said, listen, that we need proper attentiveness, you know, to listen to what they're saying, what they're complaining about. Because in listening, you also, you're able to detect the fault lines. For instance, the upturning of Roe v. Wade that she says she has a problem with. And look at the framing of that question. We're talking about abortion, the killing of an unborn child, but it has been framed differently. You can just see the euphemism, the sleight of hand has been played. They've turned it to be a woman's right over her body. How is that? How, how is that what the church is against? I mean, the moment you hear that, that somebody is dictating how you should, how you how you should um, relate with your body, you, you're already going to go up in arms because it means like you're not free. It's an assault, an affront on your autonomy. It sounds as if people are not allowing women to make their hair or to have ear piercings or, you know, to really control their entire lives. But that's not what the issue is. The issue is about another body within you another human being. So that's a different body. And these same countries have laws 
wherein if a, if, a, if a pregnant woman is killed, it's not just homicide, it's double homicide. She, in fact, recently I was looking at a, law, a, a lawsuit where um, a lady who was supposed to, um, I forgot, was she in a car or something and she was stopped over, she was pulled over by, by the police. And I think she won, she was pregnant. And um, she was on the HOV lane, high occupancy for high occupancy vehicles. So you had to have more than one person in the vehicle. But she was pregnant and she was ticketed and she fought the ticket because she was pregnant. There was a, the second person in the car, meaning her baby within her. Right. And she won that. So how can the law uh, accept that, yes, there was a second body within her and then at the same time pretend as if that doesn't matter and say you're regulating how a woman uh, um, should deal with that. But so you can see, if you listen to it properly, the phraseology, the framing is already suspect and it's deliberately done so, so that we avoid the real issue, which is murder. And that is what the church is against, so. Okay, thank you. Um, Can I come in? Yeah, sure. Minute or so? Okay, all right. So, um, so we have a question. The first part of the question, it really hits at the question of what it means to be woke again in today's world, right? Which is the question of what I call the cafeteria Catholicism, where somebody says, I'm a member of the church, I'm a Catholic, I'm a Christian, but I don't accept everything that the church teaches. That for me is a sort of cafeteria Catholicism, this pick and choose kind of mentality that there's a rich menu of options out there in the spiritual and religious marketplace. And that if I don't want Royco, I can go for Noah Maggie. If I don't want Ariel, I can go for, for Omo or I can go for Clean or something else. And I don't know how that works because it is this, I mean, how that works, that would be totally strange, like to say that before Jesus, to say, well, I am a follower of yours, I'm a disciple of yours, but I accept this thing that you say, but this other one, oh no, I'm sorry, I just can't accept it. Maybe Jesus would appreciate that, that sort of um, discipleship that says, well, I don't believe in you, rather than to say, I put one leg in and one leg out. I'm a Christian, but I'm not totally committed to all of the teachings of the church. Because it comes from, I mean, we have to interrogate that idea because, so what is it that the church is teaching that is anti-human? What is it that the church is teaching that, that we cannot find um, a stable basis for in the teaching of Jesus Christ? So I think that uh, there's this, so it's, it's clear today that we that there are a number of Christians who are living in a situation of what is called, um, it's the American um, lay theologian, um, George Wegel, who has this in a book he, um, he wrote some years back, 2014, titled Evangelical Catholicism. And it says that there are many Catholics today who are living in a position of psychological schism from the church. They say, yeah, I'm a member of the church, but their bodies are there, but their hearts and their minds are really not there. And if we go back um, further in 1994, that's 20 years before 2004, um, 10 years before 2004, there's a British sociologist of religion, um, Grace Davy, who wrote a book titled um, Believing Without Belonging. So she brings this idea of people who say, well, I believe, but I do not belong to any formal institution. This idea of I am spiritual, but not religious. Yeah, I believe in God, but I don't hold on to any institutional basis for my religious practice. And we can flip that over to talk about which goes back, which comes down to really this question we are having now of belonging without believing. So I belong to the institution. I'm a Christian. I'm a Catholic, but I don't believe what the church teaches. And um, so as what America says, we need to ask, if you don't believe anything, well, we have an answer for it. Like, that's why I say the church is an expert in humanity. We have been here for 2,000 years. There's really no question for which the church does not have an answer. If we are not clear about it, it is, it is really the case that we probably have not searched deep enough to find the answers to our questions. Otherwise, there's an answer for every question that, that we have here. So as a follow-up to that, how do I exist and have conversations with my friends without feeling like I'm a walking contradiction? <laughs> so uh, like Catherine says that we should not be afraid Tony has said that, Melky has said that, that you do not need to be afraid to stand for what you believe in. So we need to re we need to reacquire the virtue of courage in today's world because the people we are up against are not backing down. They are courageous in standing for the position that they feel that they want to proclaim. So how is it that it is a Christian who now becomes this sort of lily-livered kind of person? So 
that means going back to deepening our own understanding of the faith, because I mean, the first point of apologetics is a deep understanding of this faith. And that comes from, as Father Tony has said, you must have this deep personal friendship with Jesus in such a way that you are willing to dig deep into the resources of what you really believe. So I think that we need the virtue of courage, but we also need the virtue of compassion so that it is not as if we are up in arms against the world and that this is such of a brutally bloody kind of warfare. No, it's a spiritual warfare, but it is also an intellectual warfare, as Catherine has said. We, we have the arguments. We must have the argument. We must have the language to put it out in such a way that people out there can understand really what we are talking about. So we need that sense of compassion to say, well, I don't agree with you, but this doesn't have to become a, some kind of a fist cough. We can, we, can, we can have a dispassionate argument about what you believe and what I believe, and we can come to a reasoned understanding of the basis of our own belief. So I would love to see Christians who, I mean, I, I have friends, families that throughout the year, they read like 12 Christian books. So like one book every month and it goes around every member of the family. We need to reacquire that virtue where it is not, where apologetics and evangelization is not something reserved for priests and nuns and bishops alone. That every Christian family should develop this idea of having something to read. Like how many Christian families can say, we have read the Catechism of the Catholic Church apart from what we did for baptism, first Holy Communion and Confirmation. So this, Take personal responsibility for your faith. That's what I'm really saying, that we need to take personal responsibility for what we believe in. Like you go to the Pentecostal, I have friends who are who live the Catholic church. These are people who, I mean, they probably never read their Bibles other than going to mass and listening to the theory readings proclaimed at mass, but they suddenly become Pentecostals and you see how passionate they are about their faith. They read every tract that the pastor releases. They take their Bible seriously. I mean, and I'm like, there must be something really wrong. It's either that we are not doing it well as a church or there's something about our people that just puts them, that makes them, I mean, just laid back in terms of this personal investment in their own faith. Okay, thank you. Um, Catherine, there's a question for you actually. Um, how can no justice, no peace be unchristian and love fights be Christian? So as a Christian, what's your advice on how to handle this? Because from my understanding, people are trying to get attention to a cause that affects their life. Yeah. Okay. Can I very quickly just go in on the on the previous question? Because I was that person. I was somewhere where I said, I, the starting point is me and the church has to fit around me. And so if there's something about the church that doesn't seem right, why can't women be priests? Why can't gay couples be blessed? The church has to shift to fit around me. And I think that fails to understand that as Catholics, we believe the church is more than human. We should believe that the church is more than human um, and that Jesus Christ um, bought the right to set down the laws and limits for his church with his own blood on the cross. And when we read the gospels and when we, and formation is so important because the reason I thought the church was wrong is because I didn't really understand why it taught those things. I just didn't bother to look. I just got annoyed about it. And so if we bother to think, well, why does the church teach that only, women, only men can be priests? Why does the church teach that marriage is between a man and a woman? And really bother to find out, then we might not be so quick to say the church has to conform and fit around me. It's making ourselves God. Um, as for the second question, I think the way, um, again, it depends how you understand it, but the way just no justice, no peace is a, is, is a rallying cry to say, and it's like, unless, unless this, then I'm, then we're not going to, unless we see a social change, a social justice, we bring down rotten governments, we um, eradicate this economic inequality, then there'll be no peace. I don't think that's Christian. I think in our, especially in our faith, in our Catholic faith, it's, it's both and, it's not either or. We can both, fight for against injustice whilst whilst being peaceful and not turning against our our neighbor um and also that we we're trying to bring about the kingdom but it's not finally here we we have to also pick up our cross and say that there are there is always suffering um and i can't look at a person and know their life i can't look at someone and just based on the color of their skin know how difficult life has been for them or look at someone who's a woman and say your life is, we can't really do that. And so what does it even mean? No justice, no peace. What are we looking, what, 
where is what is the injustice first of all we need to name it um love fights well i mean ask any parent you know what did what did christ do he he came humbled himself and was beaten and and tortured and nailed to a cross what you know out of love you you it's it's saying i'll stand up um for uh, I love someone so much. I want their good so much, which is what we mean by love. Love isn't a wishy-washy feeling, is it? Although it's not, it's not less than sentiment, but it's, it's about saying, I want your good. And in order to bring about your good, I'm going to fight all those things that are pulling you away from what is good. I'm going to fight. I'm going to cut down those thorns around you that are growing up around you, my child or my student or my husband or my friends that are, that are pulling you down. And I'm, I'm going to, by god's grace try and help cut cut those down and that's because i love you you know if you if you think about an alcoholic uh, someone like george best who is an amazing footballer and whose life was ruined by alcohol ruined till he died the most loving thing someone could do is take that bottle away not give it to him no i'm going to fight those things that are dragging you down that's love okay thank you I don't think you're on mute. Yeah, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. So the, I was gonna say, when I say I'm a Christian, I'm not necessarily saying that I'm better than you. When I say I'm a Christian, I'm not saying that I'm, I'm picture perfect, I'm squeaky clean, I don't have flaws. I'm saying that I'm weak, but I'm in a relationship with someone who makes me strong, Jesus. I'm saying that I'm blind, but, but I know someone who can make me see. You know, so I, I'm even saying that, yes, I'm a sinner, but I have a potential to become a saint. So I think that if the person struggling with how to relate with a friend you know, this, in, the, in a politically correct world, I think you should make it clear that Christianity is a choice. I have chosen to be with Jesus. And every yes to Christ is a no to something. We should be ready to stand up for our faith. It will bring persecution. It will bring hardship. And on the question of somebody saying, I'm a Catholic, I identify, but I struggle with certain elements of the teaching. I think if we want to be honest, it's good to have struggle with after all, when Jesus finished teaching about the about the Eucharist, about the bread in, in John chapter six, they said very clearly, I think in verse 60, this is a very difficult teaching. Who can accept it? So, yes, it's okay to identify that it's following Christ is not bed of roses. You know, I say, my child, if you want to serve the Lord, prepare yourself for an ordeal. You know, so it's it's it, there will be challenges we'll carry our cross and follow him. And on this question of abortion. The way I see, last Sunday, the, 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 the action of Jesus is very revealing personally for me. When, when he acted as the good Samaritan, when he told that story to the lawyer. And I remember, I think it would be Martin Luther King Jr. who must have said that the difference between the action of Jesus and the action of the priest and the Levite is the kind of question that they asked. The, 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 the Levites and the, good, and, the, and the priests, they ask, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? So I think that even the question of abortion, if I think about the child as my neighbor, as the indefensible, as someone who cannot speak for himself, I have an obligation to protect the, the weak. In fact, at the core of the entire Old Testament is what is called the covenant laws. Even the Ten Commandments, it is argued, came from the, the came after the, the the covenant law and what was the covenant law protecting the weak protecting widows protecting of orphans protecting the helpless so i think that the question is i, I think that the question of if i stop to to save this child if i don't do abortion and save this child what will happen to me it goes back to selfishness and martin luther said the right question is if i don't stop to help this child if I don't stop to help this person, what will happen to him? What will happen to her? 
So I think that at every given time as Christians, we must ask ourselves, what question are we asking? And one very important thing about that story of the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10 is that Jesus had earlier, uh, the man had told Jesus about the laws, you know, I keep the law, I will do that. And Jesus Christ said to him, you know, love your neighbor. So he said, okay, go and do that. And the man said, who is my neighbor? Jesus seemed not to trust him with loving himself. Because if we love our neighbor as ourselves, and he's saying to him, act as the good Samaritan, he moved from loving your neighbor to yourself to setting a higher model, a higher standard, which is himself, not even yourself. After telling him the story of the good Samaritan, he said, go and do likewise. So my point is that I know it's difficult to practice the faith. I know we have genuine questions and we should not try to shy away from those questions, but it's important to know that serving the Lord is not easy. And if we have said yes to Jesus, it comes with challenges, it comes with a cross, and we should be ready to bear the, uh, those crosses. Ultimately, they will be our pathway to the kingdom. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to the next question, another loaded one, by the way. So in today's society, there's a real fear of voicing your opinions and living your faith truthfully without being labeled as judgmental or something phobic. So the first question to this is, where do you think this woke culture will lead the world to? And how do we as Christians find our voices and defend ourselves against this institutionalized cancel culture and wokeness? Open floor, anybody. Father Emmanuel, you're smiling. <laughs> you can take that. You're amused. <laughs> I'm still trying to reflect on my answers. Maybe for that, Melchizedek can go first. <laughs> <laughs> I do think where it's leading us to is 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 where I I mean I reflected on in at the beginning of um uh, during my introduction, my, my, my introduction, yeah, it's leading us to chaos. It's leading us to nihilism. It's leading us to complete and utter confusion. It's leading us to um, a dictatorship of relativism. It's leading, and the effect of that is exactly what Ratzinger wrote about when he said, it's going to hurt the church. It's going to rob us of even our political connections, clout, power but it will make the church purer, simpler, and holier. In other words, it's almost like when the old prophets were talking about the remnant of Israel that must always remain faithful. It's like, this is where we know those who are truly going to be faithful. This is where we see you know, the true Christians that will prevail. Because what the church teaches as, I mean, what we believe to be moral, I mean, there is, devolves from divine law. And when you're facing a culture that is saying, no, everything goes. In other words, we can legalize everything. What it's invariably doing is making you and your position illegal. So if you are legalizing immoralities and we hold that these things are immoral because it, they're not in conformity with divine laws, then automatically the church would gradually be illegitimate and her adherents be illegitimate. And that's why the cancel culture and the persecution we are facing is on the rise. So you're asking me where this negative woke culture we're talking about, the negative aspect is heading to, it's leading us to chaos. It's leading us to confusion because in the heart of man, in our desires, they're insatiable. And passions are fickle. Today we want one thing, tomorrow we want something else. The other. So if this is what should reign and there is no objective norm to which we can make reference to, and this is what we want to determine to be progress, this is what we want to call truth, a direct, directionless progress. In other words, a progress that has no telos, no end, no direction. We cannot say this is where we're going to just keep going. How do you know when you're regressing? You'd still call that progress. So it will lead us to chaos. And I keep insisting this mode of thinking is when we over-exaggerate our autonomy. We worship our will. We exalt the ego. 
we deify the ego, we become gods, everything must be as we say it is. We, we don't longer recognize that there is a law outside of ourselves. We did not create ourselves. We came from something, from somewhere. And that being is God, because it's not another finite being. I mean, if you follow it logically, there has to be an infinite being. So um, where are we going to? That's where I believe we're going to. If we allow that to prevail, it's chaos. Can I add a few words? Um. I think that I think I think that woke culture as the two for the and Emmanuel has. Can you speak a bit louder, please? Yeah. yeah. I think that the woke culture it, it has its value, you know, and I don't think that we should. Clearly, we have tried to clarify. We are just talking about the negative impact. The positive impact, if we situate it within our own local context, it has created things like Sorosoke. It has created what we are seeing today as a, a Sorosoke has now morphed, you know, into some kind of political consciousness among our young people, trying to see who to identify with and who to support. So it has its value, that consciousness that you can no longer hoodwink us, you can no longer uh, deceive us. You can no longer continue to, 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 to exploit us. So we are aware, we know no better, and we're going to resist those uh, this, this kinds of oppression. So to that extent, world culture, for example, in the context of Nigeria, can lead us to, to rediscover a country of enormous potential and lead us back to a beautiful country where things function and work. This is the positive side. The negative side, even that, I still believe, like I said, is an opportunity, is a mission territory. So every civilization reaches a point, an apogee, a point where it begins to, you know, it collapses. You know, the way things are going, we are going to reach, it's going to reach ahead. And you can see that we're already getting there. It's going to reach ahead. And when it reaches ahead, you will see that there is an emptiness, a void, a meaning that nothing can fill but Christ. When Augustine was saying, our hearts are restless until they rest in Christ, we'll come to that awareness. And then we'll be, we'll be forced painfully, like Mecca said, quoting Benedict, you know, the church may, may shrink to a small church, but painfully we'll, we'll go back to that thing that we've thrown away and see that that is the truth. So I think that maybe, you know, sometimes God permits things to go on, but ultimately, Along the line, when we reach ahead and there is a clash, then maybe this is where we begin to rediscover that we've gotten it wrong all along. So I think there is hope. It won't be, I don't see, I'm not so pessimistic about the situation of things. I just think that we need to continue to resist with love, with truth, and somewhere along the line, if things reach ahead, we'll go back to the fact, to the basics. Okay. And Emmanuel, you had something to say? Yes, just a few words. So I want to take the first part of the question, which talks about um, the fear of being labeled as judgmental. Um, so that's a genuine fear, but I think that we need to make a distinction between um, judgment and condemnation. So we find Jesus telling us in the Gospels, do not judge and you will not be judged. For judgment that is merciless will beget merciless judgment. And I think, I mean, we are constantly making judgments every day. I mean, for everybody who is attending this session, you have made a judgment to be here against being somewhere else, maybe in the cinema, seeing a movie or out with your friends at a bar or something. So we're constantly making judgments every day. So um, judgment is a human thing. But what Jesus is saying when he says so, like when people quote that text of the gospel, do not judge and you will not be judged. Jesus is not saying that we should not pass judgment. We should not make judgments over things. He is saying that we should not condemn because to condemn is to say that this person is irredeemable, irremediable, that this person has crossed the line of redemption. But God doesn't even say that of anybody. I mean, there's always the 11th hour for everybody. So um, what, what, what it means is that we should not condemn people, but we can pass judgments on, on, on things, on attitudes, on behaviors, without necessarily condemning the person who is, who is taking, carrying out this action. Now, the, the British philosopher Karl Popper talks about what he calls the paradox of tolerance. 
And he says that if a society is tolerant without limit, its ability to be tolerant is eventually seized or destroyed by the intolerant. So, and that's something that we Christians need to be a bit more careful of. So when we say, well, be compassionate, be kind to people, it doesn't mean that we should be tolerant of falsehood because a time comes where the thing you are tolerating eventually doesn't tolerate you. It eventually undercuts you. And so, yeah, so, so he talks about, he says that we can, we must maintain a tolerant society, but the society must retain the right to be intolerant of intolerance. We need to be intolerant of intolerance because the people we are, we are, we are having this, I mean, in this circle of discussion, there, there's a certain intolerance which deprives the Christian faith of a breathing space. The only, the only opinion that needs to be heard is my own opinion. Any contrary opinion is to be, is to be canceled out. So, let me conclude with, there's a book that Fulton Sheen wrote in 1931 titled Old Errors and New Labels. And this is what he says, a very fascinating quotation from that book. He says, tolerance applies only to persons, but never to truth. Intolerance applies only to truth, but never to persons. Tolerance applies to the erring, intolerance to the error. So we tolerate the person, but we do not tolerate the error. So like Jesus says to the woman caught in adultery, I do not condemn you. But did he make a judgment? Yes, go and do not sin again. Is to say, well, you have done what is wrong and I do not want you to do it again. That's making a judgment. But did he condemn the woman? No, but did he judge her? Yes. Okay, thank you. So in the interest of time, there's a lot of questions that we can't get to, um, but we will take them um, and respond to them in future sessions, but I want to close out with one last question. So what are some practical things that we can do to live in a woke society? And what scriptures can we hold on to in times like these? What are some practical things that we can do? I mean, we kind of touched on little things here and there, but I just want like a final statement. What are some practical things that we can do to live in a woke society? And are there any scriptures that we can hold on to in times like these? Maybe I should start off first. So the first practical thing that we need to do is to ask the right question. Like the one fundamental question I think every Christian needs to ask is the question um, that the rich young man asked Jesus in Matthew's Gospel 10, 17, Mark's Gospel 10, 17 good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? For me, that's the fundamental Christian question. Everything that we do in this world, every judgment you make, every ideology you adopt, every religion you hold on to, every philosophy you espouse, every action, every behavior of yours must present from that question, will this lead me to eternal life? What must I do to inherit eternal life? So we must evaluate everything we do from the perspective of our eternal end. So for me, this is the fundamental eschatological question looking at the everything we do in the light of our eternal end. Will this action, will this philosophy, will this position, will this religion, will this behavior, will this attitude take me to my eternal goal? So if we evaluate every question from that standpoint, then we are, we are starting off from the right, um, the right place. The practical, more practical thing to do is that we need to band together. We need to, we need, there, there needs to be solidarity. We need to have this solidarity. Christianity is a is is a is is a communitarian religion. It's not something that is concerned about just my personal salvation. You must be concerned about the salvation of the world because God so loved the world. So let us not withdraw into zones of our own personal security. We must be concerned about the welfare of other people as well. So we need we need to hold hands together. We need to journey along together. The faith of the individual must trend, must be must feed into the faith of the community and the faith of the community um, also strengthens the faith of the individual. So I would want to see more Christian solidarity, Christians who understand what they're up against and that they band together as people who learn together, circles of, of young people who are studying their faith, whether on a weekly basis or on a monthly basis is important outside of what we do in the formal catechism classes of Christian associations of people who pray and intercede for the world. We need to have more of that Christian solidarity. I think that that's one um, important practical thing that we can, we can do. Thank you. Can I just say a quick thing? Sure. Yeah, um, 
I think knowing our faith, being able to give an account of it is really important. And I agree with everything Father Emmanuel said. Um, we have to um, know our faith in order to speak truth into the culture, uh, make the time to, to know it, get, get in front of our blessed Lord in the sacraments, ask him to open our, our hearts and our minds and to speak in love. Um, and we can also manage our expectations and take and, ex and expect that the world is not going to like it. You know, they look how they treated Christ. So John six, is it, um, you know, how do you, someone else will get the quote, right? But um, look how they treated me. And so to manage our expectations, look, we're going out into the culture. It's not gonna be a walk in the park, uh, but it's the right thing to do. Um, and I have so many friends who say, I agree with you. I agree with this, but I'm afraid and I don't wanna say anything. And as long as we remain in the shadows and are afraid, the, the culture will wash over us. And so we have to just have that confidence and expect that it won't be easy. Thank you. Are we good? Okay. I want to add that I have two passages here. Okay. One is Ephesians chapter six, put on the armor of God. I think, I think the whole, put on the whole armor of God. So Ephesians chapter six is one passage. I think we, we need to put on the whole armor of God. Um, um, first Peter chapter three, verse 15 is good. When we are dealing with people, you know, be ready at all times to give account of the hope you have in you ready at all time, but do it with humility, you know, do it with, with meekness. Um, and then I think Luke chapter, Luke chapter 21, verse 36, stay at wake at all times, you know, praying. Um, there, there, was a, there was a line I wrote to this morning when I was thinking about this. I said, we need to stay spiritually awake, morally vigilant, fervently prayerful, constantly guided by the Holy Spirit and radical rooted in our faith but more importantly staying spiritually awake so i think these three passages uh, will help us at least from my own point of view luke 21 36 you know staying awake all the time spiritual vigilance so the, the, the price of eternal liberation is eternal vigilance so we need to perpetually we need to remain perpetually vigilant and then we need uh, that passage ephesians chapter 6 let us put on is a warfare catherine highlighted it clearly let me just take this opportunity to thank catherine before i just stop uh, Catherine, thank you so much. Catherine is, uh, is here with me. I've been doing a lot together. Thank you on behalf of Father Melky and uh, Father Manuel uh, since I'm dropping the mic now. Thank you immensely. We have been working together and been doing a lot together for the faith and we'll continue to do that. Uh, may God bless you and keep for all that you do. Thank you. And, and before you go, I'll just throw in one last passage. And this is because also of what Catherine said, you know, when you were talking about, yes, if they persecuted Christ, our master, then we should expect also that um, we're going to face the same. And that passage is Matthew 10, 19, which encourages us when they hand you over, don't worry about what you have to say because God's spirit will speak through you. And that's, that's an expression of our deep faith and conviction in the one who has called us and in the one whose mission we're trying to carry out, trusting in his strength that he gives us to endure all that we will face. Thank you. Thank you to all our panelists, Father Melky, Father Emmanuel, Father Anthony, and of course our guest speaker, Catherine. Thank you very much. I also Mama. want to thank all the people working tirelessly behind the scenes. Isioma, Ibitimi, Nenda, Bibi, thank you guys so much. Um, we have these sessions on the third Sunday of every month. I've also put in the chat um, a link so you can give us topic suggestions and things you'd like to hear or issues you'd like us to discuss. So thank you, everyone. Follow us on our YouTube page. Just go and subscribe. And then at the end of this session, this will be uploaded to our YouTube um, channel. You can also watch the first um, session as well. So thank you, everyone. And God bless you, Father Emmanuel. Do you mind giving us a final blessing? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, our hearts are full of thanks and gratitude. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify your holy name. We thank you for this wonderful session that we have had this day of reflecting and discussing and sharing our faith and the challenges that are bound in our world today. We ask you to continue to guide and direct us, share the delight of your Holy Spirit in our hearts so that we may see what hope your call holds out for each one of us strengthen our resolve to please you, to serve you above all else, 
even when we meet with difficulties and persecution along the way. Give us grace to remain steadfast. May your mother Mary, our mother, continue to intercede and support us in our own journey of faith and in our journey through life. And let our every word, thought, and action be pleasing to you. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And one Amen. last person I forgot mm -hmm. to Arrow with your spirit. May our almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. And to our tech guru extraordinaire, EBA, thank you very, very much. Um, so we'll see you on the third Sunday of next month. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Blondie. Thank you, Blondie. Thank you, Blondie. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you.